and we are live. You are hearing right now the sounds of the lovely hand pan by my lovely husband, who will stick his face in, in here in a moment. Welcome to Ornithovoyance Live. Um, I am Diane Rains, otherwise known as Bard Owl in some circles. Um, and, and I have other names in other circles. For example, in the crow world, I'm that's just an aside. <laughs> I just like to talk like a crow. Thank you for coming. Um, let's see. If y'all would um, like to let us know that you're in the audience, if you make a comment on YouTube here, uh, we will be able to see uh, who is here. And it would be lovely to find out where everybody is from. So uh, we are going to be doing a series of these ornithovoyance sessions and it'll be about once a month and we will be connecting to birds in every session. Ornithovoyance is what it's about. To summarize very quickly, I actually have been enamored of birds in wildlife science with an animal behavior specialty, uh, also a PhD education in veterinary physiology. And in all of that schooling, I learned that I didn't begin to connect to birds on the kind of deep level that I wanted until I became a druid with Obad and began working through the Gorsi and working with my own local wonderful druid grove, almost telepathic level with birds. And so I've been developing this connection over the past year or so into a system of connecting with birds with spirit. So I connect with them through science. I connect through them with direct communication, talking as a crow. I talk to my crows, I'm part of their flock, and blue jays and goldfinches, and I, I've learned languages of the birds. And that's something that everybody can do, by the way. But the ornithovoyance practice goes deeper than that. So we're going to give you a taste of that today. Um, and here's how the session is going to go. We will start off, um, first of all, I will give, do a little slideshow to let you know a little more about the bird we're going to work with today. And then after the slideshow, we will uh, purify and cleanse our space and then I will be doing feather divination. And we're going to consider the question how we all can holistically exist and thrive within a pandemic world. And as things change rapidly, what can birds teach us about how we can adapt to this brave new world? So we'll do feather divination and then I will be leading a shape-shifting meditation, a, a visualization, a flight of the imagination, where we will become birds and we will soar. And kind of at the, in the middle of that or towards the end of that uh, meditation, I'm going to actually ask you to stay in bird form mentally and open your eyes because we also have some film to show you uh, that will give you the perspective of the bird. All right, well, the species that we are going to work with today is one of my very favorites, and I'm wearing some of its feathers, actually. The species is called the Batalur. It's the fire eagle of Africa. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, this is one of the first birds that I really connected to spiritually and so that's why I thought we would start with this bird today and also because this bird is associated with the legend of the phoenix. And as we all are trying to survive in, in the day of COVID, no matter what has happened to our lives, we, we all want to rise from the ashes. Whatever the future brings, we want to rise from the ashes of this pandemic and shine. Rise and shine. All right, so we're going to start with uh, this little slideshow, and I'll tell you more about the Bachelor Eagle. And I'm just going to share my screen here with you so you. All right. 
Hopefully you can see this well. If you're having trouble, comment in YouTube. All right, the Batalur Eagle. The Batalur Eagle is a smallish eagle as eagles go. Uh, it makes its home in Africa and it is one of the most striking birds of that size, uh, the, one of the most striking predators visually that you'll ever encounter if you get to go to Africa or a zoo and encounter it, which we're planning to do when we can travel again. Not Africa, but a zoo. <laughs> they have this magnificent plumage. They, uh, one of the reasons that I think of this bird as white like, like heat. And they live in several parts of Africa. They're doing okay population-wise. They're classed as a species of least concern currently, which is good, but all birds are facing problems due to climate change and habitat loss. So this, this is one of the things that uh, give, and it spreads its wings, its massive wingspan wide, and it turns to face the sun. And of course, the sun in Africa is mighty hot, but this bird is adapted to withstand this heat. And, and when it spreads its wings and stands there proudly, that invokes the image of the phoenix. And, with a, and it's an, an incredibly agile flyer. And here's another photo of, of that same behavior, spreading the wings. And it will literally turn in place as the sun moves. It'll turn to get the best uh, shot at that solar energy. And here's a little film of this behavior. And sometimes they bathe in, in the pools and water holes and they spread the wings to dry, but also they just do it just to catch the sun. What an amazing, imposing figure. They do uh, what looks like a prayer posture, an ant or termite colony, and it lets the ants crawl on its feathers. And then when it's, when it's got feathers full of ants, it shakes its feathers. The ants fly off, but they're upset, so they release formic acid, and that coats the feathers and kills any mites or lice or other parasites on the bird. So. This is a fascinating bird to me because of its elemental associations. We have the element of fire because of its phoenix pose. We have the element of earth because it's literally lying on the earth. And they do this incredibly spooky display, part of their courtship display. This was actually in a zoo that this was taken. Uh, and, and this is just freaky. I love it. Just We'll just look. That, that gives me, I was going to say goosebumps, that gives me battler bumps. <laughs> this bird is an incredible soarer. It, they, they, like vultures, can actually visually see thermals as a shimmer. They can see currents of thermals. They, they soar. They can be very high or sometimes they soar low over the sand in search of food. They are predators. They are hunters. They can take small vertebrates. Um, but they're also carrion eaters, and so they spend 80% of their lives on the wing searching for food. And they have such an intensely acute eyesight that, you know, they can spot a very, they can spot a small snake that they might want to catch from hundreds of feet. I mean, food, they all go in uh, for the feast. And one of the things this bird is adept at finding is the prey killed by leopards. When leopards kill a gazelle or, or other large prey, they often drag it into a tree, and sometimes they leave it there while they go off and do other things. Well, the bachelor can spot that, and then the bachelor lands uh, and steals some of that carcass. 
as do the vultures that follow. That sound is a sound that the bachelor makes beating the air, and that is how bachelor got its name. Bachelor is French for acrobat, and it refers to these in incredible uh, flights with rolling and diving and, and swooping um, and beating the air to make sound. All right, so that's a little introduction to the bachelor. And because of all of these qualities that, that we've, of the battle, as the case may be. And the way this works is every bird that I work with, and I have close to a hundred species now that I've been working with, all feathers from naturally molted, cruelty-free, from birds in zoos and rehab facilities. And um, all of them I, I legally own because I'm not keeping any of the species that occur here. That's, that's illegal. So what we'll be doing is we will be um, creating a species in an ecosystem. Um, that's where we gain insights and, and that we can apply to our own lives. All right, so we're gonna start out with, um, we're just gonna kind of get into a calm meditative state and then we'll begin the divination process. So I'm gonna ask you to just sit comfortably. If you'd like, you can close your eyes or we're also gonna do some smudging with my Firebird fan. I use the word smudging probably incorrectly. We're not using smoke or fragrance because I'm seriously allergic to those things. Bird of fire, bird of dawn, be with us as we venture on. Clear all negative energy. Open our bird eyes and help us to see. And now we will begin the divination. So I have a, a selection of feathers, um, all corresponding with elements, earth, air, fire, water, and spirit. And we're going to create a layout of these birds and representing these elements. And we're gonna create what I call a phoenix layout. And we're gonna let the bachelor choose the feathers for the layout. We will start with the element of air. And so first we do kind of a fan shaped sort of a tail layout. And we have five species. And then we will let the bachelor feather choose from this group. By the way, um, in this work, I connect with um, a very ancient force or energy or deity, entity, however you want to view it. And I often call on her, personified or not, it's up to, to you to decide, but in, in, in my mind, she's kind of real. And I call on her to help me in matters of bird uh, spirituality. So Aves guide this feather to select a species representing the element of air. I, 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 I will be heard. I, 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 I am the bird. 
and we have intersected primarily the macaw feather. This is a hyacinth macaw. And this begins our layout. So this feather from the hyacinth macaw represents the element of air. And in the firebird that we're creating, these are the eyes. Eyes, vision for perspective. Next, we will do, we will find a species to represent the element of water. And we'll do the same thing. We'll lay out a selection of species. Move this one over a bit. And this little guy is quite small, but also quite special. We'll put him in the middle here. All right, and we'll choose our representative of the element of water. I, 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 I will be heard. I, 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 I am the bird. Well, that pretty much covered this little guy, so we're going to choose this bird. This is a penguin feather. This represents the element of water, and we're putting it in the middle because water is associated with emotion and the heart. So this feather is for felt truth. Now we put the rest of our water feathers away. And next, we will do the element of fire. All right, get these feathers out again. see all these? Yes. That one's a little small, but... All right. <laughs> I do I need that at Relocating my diviner feather here. There you are. You never know where birds are going to fly up to. Because, by the way, they have their own minds. Oh. All right. Element of fire. I, 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 I will be heard. I, Actually going to do two with fire because these are going to represent the wings. I, 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 I will be heard. I. Interesting. So we've got two selected here. By golly, we'll use them both. wings can have more than one feather, of course. All right. So we've got, uh, we've got air for perspective and vision. 
We've got water for heart and felt truth. We've got fire for wings, and wings are for direction and power of movement. Put these away. Others, so we're gonna just put the tip in the layout here so we don't play favorites. It takes a little maneuvering with these different sizes of feathers to do this. But uh, I think I'm going to switch this guy. So just the quill is in the layout. Can you see this feather? That'll work. Diviner feather, battler feather, and we'll pick spirit. I, 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 I will be heard. I, I, I. Love this, but eh, sleeves are not practical. Okay, so put this back because I'm learning. And then the last element is the element of earth, which will also be in our tail feather spread. The practicality of everyday life. All right, so we will do another layout for the element of earth. Are they all in there? Let me move it over just a bit. So we can see them all. Yeah, not sure. One thing when working with feathers, you never want to be in a breezy place. <laughs> I I, 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 I am the bird. Okay, when it doesn't take like that, we just go in. It's still deciding. <laughs> hmm, interesting. We put these extra feathers away. And now what we do is we, and so our question was, how can we take a holistic approach to life during and uh, the pandemic and as things begin to return closer to normal, whether they ever will again, who knows for sure, but so we'll start with eyes for perspective. It's kind of hard to get the beautiful color of this feather. This is from a, a hyacinth macaw. And macaws are uh, majestic and um, popular birds. Um, of course, uh, lots of folks have them as pets. I'm just um, looking up something here so I can give us more information about this species seem to organize it, but that's all right. All right, so the hyacinth macaw uh, is endemic to South America, and like most parrots, the macaw is incredibly intelligent, very, very clever. Um, in captivity, as a pet, they are very, very adept at uh, solving puzzles, 
um, in games, and of course they become very attached to their humans. In the wild, outside of all that influence, this is still a, a splendid bird. The, the plumage is um, just uh, almost entirely a very deep lustrous blue. And by the way, um, at the end of this whole session, when we're all done, I'm going to upload a photo of our layout here. And I will also then in the comments uh, on the Ornithovoyans Facebook page, on, on probably just on my page itself, um, I'll, I'll upload some links where you can learn more about each of these species and you can find pictures and so forth because they're all beautiful in their own way. So the roles that the hyacinth macaw plays in my Ornithovoyans and in its ecosystem, ever and the strong. The splendid, of course, the beautiful blue feathers, uh, the plumage, that is all part of courtship display. And the strength comes in with, actually I have this little stuffed macaw. It's not a hyacinth macaw, but this, this beak, this very, very big, heavy beak is incredibly strong. There's a lot of force that that beak can generate and it's an adaptation to cracking the very hardest nuts that it finds in the rainforest. They also eat fruits and a few other things, but, but that beak is adapted for crushing and opening. So now, now that we know something about the bird, we think, well, how does this apply to our question? Well, certainly strength in times of trouble this is something that we're all trying to find, trying to learn how to do, to have the strength to make what changes we need to make, um, to, to keep our spirits up as best we can, and to move forward and, and live our lives in the midst of this pandemic. And problems are kind of like nuts in a very hard with the COVID crisis are just trying to crack that nut and within the, within the shell are answers. What will the future hold? What do we need to do to stay safe? What do we need to do to keep others safe? How do we move forward? So I think what this bird is telling us is keep working on that. Use whatever tools you have, your, your common sense and feather. Now we'll move on to our next feather, the element of water. This little tiny feather is from the Gentoo penguin. The Gentoo is a species that is actually a, a southern bird. They live in Antarctica. And they're, of course, very specialized to survive in really harsh environments. You know, that, that incredibly cold, harsh, barren land. Several roles in uh, my Ornithovoyance um, collection. Um, they are, I call them the faithful. These, these birds are monogamous and it may not necessarily be entirely for life but when they commit to a partner, they commit very fully. They often will stay together for three years and sometimes more. And they're also very communal. I call another role is the communal. These birds live social morality that the Gentoos practice. Because they are monogamous, um, there is no tolerance for straying. <laughs> So some birds, you know, they're, they're monogamous, but there are extra pair, um, pair members of the group, basically police, which is kind of a remarkably sophisticated moral behavior on the part of a bird. People, people don't really understand how incredibly intelligent most birds are and, and emotional, and they share um, a lot of what we do in our society. Penguin species. So if we think about what this feather can be telling us, what this species, species can be telling us about our life 
during and after COVID. I think we have to think communally. We, we have to, even as we go back to our lives, which everybody is so anxious to do, we have to continue to think communally because if the weakest in our community fall, that has a repercussions on everyone. No one is really expendable. Um, and I think like the Gen 2 who keep an eye on other folks to try to, you know, um, keep the morality and the rules of the society intact, I think that as we go back to our lives, we have to still think communally and we have to be cognizant of others in our social group and in our environment. So, you know, um, I don't want to get on a soapbox, but I've seen, um, as Stu and I have been going out to do some birding with safe social distancing, we've seen a lot of people not practicing any social distancing, not wearing masks, gathering in groups that are not safe. And that's going to just prolong everything. We're going to we're going to be having more spikes in uh, the virus um, infection rate. Um, so I think the penguin is telling us, you know, don't give up just yet on on being aware of the effects of our actions on the entire community. All right, so let's move on to our wings. Fire, the element of fire. And f is from one of my very favorite species. This is from the secretary bird. And I have a, just a little secretary bird action figure. It's my feather. You can stand there. So the secretary bird is just a fascinating bird. They are endemic to Africa. They are predators. And they, and they can fly perfectly well, but they don't hunt as much from the, well, they spend a lot of time on the ground. They are really fast runners and they, they sometimes they will spot prey from the air. They particularly like to eat snakes, which is why their uh, genus and species is Sagittarius serpentarius. So what they'll do is they'll spot something that they're hunting but then they'll chase it down. They don't dive from the air like some, and they also have the most amazing feathers, crests and things. So they basically catch up with their prey and they stomp it to death. And they are very passionate about doing this. So um, zoos that have secretary birds in there to death. So that's, a, that's a, a really different way for a raptor to approach a problem. And they're also quite splendid. They're also the splendid uh, is another role they play because they have these incredibly beautiful feathers for display. And they do a little bit of carrying and eating as well. And so they have bare skin around their eyes. I also consider the secretary bird to be a sacred bird. To me, it's sacred. I guess I can't say, I wouldn't be surprised if it's sacred to some tribes in Africa as well. And this bird is sacred to me because when I first started to connect with the bird goddess, just, you know, doing a meditative visualization, she appeared to me in the form of this bird. And I didn't actually know what this bird was at first. I just kind of had a vision of, of this incredible crest and, and a colorful face. And then when I researched and I found this bird, it's like, oh, that's, that's, that's my goddess. That's Amy's. So... Applying this to our question. Well, you know, once we get out there, once we get back into life, a lot of folks are going to be running, 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 just running, you know, at their old pace, trying to get back precisely to normal as quickly as possible. And yeah, to some extent, we need to run with our freedom. But... COVID could still come along and stomp us to death. Just saying. So again, let's run with freedom, but maybe take a little bit of a cautious approach to that uh, running. All right, so the next wing feather, see picture of these birds later. 
The red-crested turaco is again endemic to Africa and there's some very interesting things about this bird, about its adaptations. This is the only bird in the entire animal kingdom in which this red, the red of the feathers, is due to an actual pigment that you found, find in the feathers. Other birds that we see as red, like the cardinal or the red macaw, it's not based on pigment. Whereas with the turco, all the turco species that have red, that's a true pigment. So that is, that's something quite unique to that bird. The other thing about the turcos is they have specialized feet that are with um, specialized toes that are adapted to grab tree trunks. They, they spend most of their time in the trees, in the canopy, and they actually walk up and down it um, looking for food. And uh, they, they eat fruits and, and insects and um, some vegetative bits, but, but they're adapted for climbing up and down. They also, I call them the devoted. They are one of the birds that have, um, that are monogamous and usually keep their mate during their whole lives. It's always a good idea to be true to yourself. Show your true colors to the world and to, your, and, and to yourself and cherish who you are, the truth of who you are. And don't change because of societal pressure. So when we go out there, it's gonna, people are gonna feel awkward if they're wearing masks and nobody else is. People are gonna feel awkward if they're standing back from a group and everybody else is milling about. I'm just gonna say, you know, if you feel the need to be cautious because COVID isn't going away for a while, probably years, don't let the pressures of anybody else change your behavior. Stay true to who you are and show your true colors. All right, so our last wing feather is from, uh, let's see, this one is from the long-legged buzzard. Uh, yes, the long-legged buzzard is another raptor and it's pretty widespread. It's, it's found in the Palearctic region, kind of the temperate, uh, more northerly regions of Europe and Asia and Africa. It's, it's, a, it's a powerful hunter, but unlike some birds um, like the bachelor who fly long distances and stay on the wing for a long time looking for food, the long-legged buzzard basically spends most of its time just sitting, perching in a tree and watching. So it takes a watch and wait strategy, or in sometimes they're not even in a tree, they're in open, they like open habitat, savannas and grasslands. And they can almost hunt like a cat. They'll, they'll be stealthy, they'll wait, and they'll watch. And when they see a, a predator, a, a prey animal, then they very quickly leap from their perch and, and, and nab it. The long-legged buzzard I associate with fire, and this is also true of the secretary bird, because both of these species actually will go to the scene of a, of a bushfire, a natural fire, and they will fly above it or hover on the edges. And as the small animals are trying to flee the flames, these predators will snatch them up. So they actually take advantage of, of the element of fire, but also are very adept at not burning up themselves, which is a good thing. So in terms of the COVID question, there's a lot of waiting and watching. We've been doing this ever since this all started, waiting and watching to see what's going to happen, what's gonna happen next. There'll be resurgence of what will be happening and wait and watch and then act accordingly. So now we will move to our last two feathers. These are the element of spirit and the element of earth. Let's start with earth. And the tail on a bird 
both serves as a rudder, but it also helps the bird to balance. And so these feathers will um, help us to find balance. And I'm just looking up. Oh, here we go, Western Capricaly. Right, so this is a feather from the Western Capricaly. The Capricaly is a kind of grouse. They're, um, they're native to Europe and mostly the male and the female. The male in particular, his role is the performer. I don't know if you uh, know anything about um, bird behavior, but some species of birds in mating season gather in a particular place, a clearing in the woods, depending on their habitat or an open meadow. And we call this a lek, L-E-K. And the males perform vigorous courtship displays. And, and this is what the Western Capricaly does, a very vigorous courtship display. And the females stand around, they're the audience, and they watch the boys, and they whoever they think is the best performer, that's who they will then take as a mate. So uh, the, the Capricaly males, when they gather on their lex, they have three different kinds of amazing displays. One is, um, you know, strutting around and spreading their feathers wide, and they have kind of a fan tail, sort of like a turkey. Um, they boom. They, they make booming sounds. They have calls, so they're very vocal during their displays. But they do also an amazing aerial display. In the air, they do um, some, some interesting flight maneuvers to try to attract the females, and then they boom in the air. So that must be a magnificent thing to see. And they also display from the tops of the trees. Well, they're very loud, raucous voices. Now, these, these leks, interestingly, although these birds aren't really extremely long-lived, there are traditional uh, leks, traditional display grounds, that have been in use by Capricales, by generations of Capricales, for over 100 years. That's kind of amazing when you think that that tradition of this space for our dance, for our courtship displays, can be, and the ancient. So the, while the male is a very, very vigorous performer, once, he's, once the male and female pair up and they mate, then they have nothing else to do with each other. No monogamy, no long bond. Um, you know, they do the deed, she lays her eggs, he goes off, and then she doesn't want anything more to do with him. She raises the young all on her own. So very independent females in this particular species. And how does that apply to us holistically? Well, you know, tradition is an important thing. Um, I think we've been finding some of our traditions have been getting shaken up a little bit you know, um, in, in many communities because new rules uh, to go with COVID. So I think we, we need to try to hold on to some of our traditional, and, and that is a very fine goal. And so, you know, being a performer is, is fine. On, on a more kind of a literal level, you know, folks like Stu and me, who are artists and performers, musicians, other kinds of performers, We've been pretty hard hit because we don't have, we can't go to live audiences. Um, so I'm just going to put in a plug. It, it, there are musicians out there who, who could really benefit um, from you buying their music. And um, I'm not necessarily referring to us, but uh, there's lots of musicians and performers out there who could use your help during the pandemic. And as far as independence goes, that's always a good thing, right? And, you know, I think with the close quarters that we're having because of the pandemic, sometimes it's kind of hard to find that sort of that independence, but it's something we need to keep doing because independence is important. We don't want to become like completely dependent on the person we're, um, <laughs> we're locked down with during, during this uh, pandemic. Though I quite like the person I'm locked out with. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not giving him up anytime soon. 
All right, so we've done Capricale. Now our last feather in our spread. This is one of my favorite species too. This is from the Stellar's Sea Eagle. This is just a gorgeous bird. It's a huge black and white eagle. It's, it's by mass, it's the largest eagle species on earth. They are very, very restricted in their range. Um, they, they are found uh, in coastal areas and a little bit inland. Uh, Siberia, and I'm just finding the, some details. I, I have a database of uh, these birds, and I actually know a lot of them, but there's a lot of details that we don't want you to miss. So, so the northeast Russian coast, Siberia, that's one of their endemic spots. Um, there's, a, there's a big ocean uh, up there called the Sea of Oxdocks, I can't pronounce it. And um, there's a whole lot of little islands in there, and, and this bird also occurs on those islands. They're also found in northern parts of Japan and Korea. They, they are very powerful hunters, but they mostly fish. Kind of like our bald eagle, they mostly eat fish. But they, but they tend to occur on very rocky coasts with very high cliff tops where they um, often put their nest. And they, they can hunt from a great height. Kind of like um, the long-legged buzzard, they, they, will, they, they sometimes hunt on the wing, but, but they often are perched on this tall cliff top. And when they spot a fish, and they particularly like salmon, so they, they take advantage of salmon runs when they happen, but they eat other fish as well. So when, when they spot a fish, then they will swoop down in a long dive and snatch it out of the water. And some of these birds can be sitting 100 feet above the water. They have incredible monocular vision, like all eagles. They spot a fish and then like swoop 100 feet down, grab the power. And they're one of the rarest, if not the rarest, eagle on Earth because they have such a restricted range. This species, I also call them the ancient. This species is thought to be a glacial relic. What that means is that eons ago, it evolved in this area. So we think this bird has been in that area, you know, intact with their um, territories intact from generation to generation through multiple ice ages. So this, and they never have occurred anywhere else, you know, never have established um, residence anywhere else. They are in a few zoos here and there. Not to be really difficult to survive. Sometimes we just have to muster up that energy to endure. And I think that's what the human species is trying to do now. You know, we, we are a lot more widespread, obviously, than the stellar sea eagle, but we are searching for endurance. We are searching for a way for our societies, our families, our lives to endure and go on for a long time. And this is the challenge for our species and for us individually to adapt to what has happened to our species because we've opened this Pandora's box and this won't be the last pandemic probably. But we need to know it's possible. And if this bird, this, this magnificent eagle who's been just stuck in this tiny little area of the world for eons. If they can survive, I think we can too. All right, so that's our divination layout. Now we're going to move on to um, an, another part of my ornithovoyance practice. I'm going to talk you through this. We are going to become the bachelor and we are going to fly. And I do this a lot. Oh, by the way, I must say a disclaimer. I know we're all adults here and we're all smart, but shape-shifting, if you're a really accomplished shaman, some people think you actually leave your body and actually borrow the body of an animal. We're not trying to do that necessarily here. We're just taking a flight of the imagination and I make no claims about whether you're actually going to be a bird or not. And I, in my So now I invite you to close your eyes 
Breathe deeply. I'll take some deep breaths together. Imagine that you're in Africa. It's morning. The sun is just coming up over the horizon, but already it's hot. It's very hot. You're standing on the sand and you feel the soft grains of the sand between your toes. You feel the heat that comes from the heart of Africa radiating up through the sand, into your legs, and up through your body. It is warm, it's good. As the sun gets higher, you turn to face directly into the sun. And you spread your wings, your massive long wings, all this warmth, Feel it leap into the air and you rise. You can see the thermals. You have the vision of the bachelor. You can see the shimmering of the air that tells you where these currents of heat are. And you ride them like a surfer. You spread your wings. You catch a thermal. You don't even need to flap. You just fly. And you feel a gentle, warm breeze ruffle through your feathers, the golden feathers on your back rise up with a gentle breeze. You feel it tickle your skin beneath the feathers. You feel the heat of the sun. You're closer to the sun now and you absorb that strength, that solar energy. And you look around you. You're effortless. You're floating high, high above the African savanna. They float and watch life unfold beneath you. And it feels so good. You are free. You are above the earth. You are above all of earth's troubles. You are the battler, the firebird, the phoenix of Africa. Hold that feeling of soaring, of flight, but open your eyes and watch your kingdom, your domain, Below, actually, you can close your eyes again. Below you, you see humans in the villages. And you know very well that you are sacred to these people. You are the sacred firebird of Africa. And you hear the people, you hear the people tell your story, the story of the bachelor or as they know it, Ingong Hulu. No life on the earth. It was empty, except for a small seed. A seed that lay deep in the hot sands of Africa. And one day, the seed sprouted and from it grew a mighty tree, the tree of life. Massive in its trunk, with limbs that seemed to stretch for miles. A huge, green, long canopy of, of needles and leaves. And the tree of life looked at the empty earth. I will give them to populate the earth. 
And so one by one, the animals of the world, like ripe fruit, fell from the tree of life to the sands of Africa. And from there they moved on to Palm, fire eagle of Africa. And she burst forth from the fiery heart at the center of the tree. And she leaped out and spread her wings and landed on the cheetah leaped down from the tree and ran across the savanna faster than the wind. Other birds flew up and filled the skies with wings. The otter jumped out, jumped into the river and began to play and tumble with the joy of water. The giraffes roamed across the earth until they found tall trees and then they stretched their necks high to graze on the choicest, most tender leaves. And looking around, Ngong Hlu saw that life was very, very good. And she spread her wings wide and in celebration, she beat the air with a sound that was heard for miles. And she tipped back her head and she cried with joy. And thus was life, was creation announced. The battler has had many, many children since that first age. And all the tribes of Africa consider a descendant of the first bird is seen to be nesting on Zulu land. The chief of the tribe sends out a decree to all of his people. No one is to harm the Ngong Halu. No one must disturb her nest. And when the nest is complete and the first egg is laid, the chief of the Zulus invites all the most important members of the tribe, the Alpha. But as we know, good things often come to an end. And so, one day, will this world end. And the world may end in fire. All will be consumed, whether metaphorically or in, in truth, fire will devour the earth. And on the last day of creation, as the earth tumbles into ash, the Ngongkalu will once more stand upon her rock, spread her wings and beat the air. Hungum, hungum, hungum. And she will cry, this time a mournful cry. And thus she will announce the end of the world. So, too, the, the world in ash will rise again. The tree of life will come again. The animals will come again, the humans. And in Gonghalu, once more, will stand upon her boulder. And your eyes, keep that flight going and watch your kingdom unfold before you. The domain. Ancient rhythms deeply felt. The golden airship. You sprang. And the fire of Africa.
cup is yours Like the phoenix you rise From the sands of time And your power floods Through ancient doors Then you rise and spread those fire wings across the sky And you ride the thermals to the sun Then your vision gleams in the shimmering air You've been here before You've been everywhere You are the phoenix of the dawn You rise from ashes and ever move on As you tumble up and down Master of the wind You will end once more and then you'll begin you are the phoenix of the dawn you are the ancient one you'll always go on You are the battler, acrobat of skies. I see the fiery heart of Africa burning in your eyes. And when I spread my wings with you and take to the air, I've been here before. I've been everywhere We are the phoenix of the sky We are the firebirds You and I I see the blazing light of ancient fire burning in your eyes And when I spread my wings with you and take the phoenix of the skies We are the firebirds We shall become sunset in Africa and we have been on the wing all day and we've loved it but it's time to come to earth you are the acrobat and so on your way down to the ground you tumble barrel rolls absorb that beautiful rosy glow then fold your wings and now Come back to your human body. Rub the palms of your hands together to feel the skin. Let go of your feathers. Welcome home. This about once a month. Uh, the next session will probably be early July. And so you can follow along on my Facebook page, Ornithovoyance on Facebook, um, to find out precisely when that event will take place. Um, I want to let you know a couple of things. Uh, the song that you heard is um, an original um, by Stu and me. Neptune's Keep is the name of our band. And that particular song, The Bachelor, will be on 
an album coming out next year. But we actually have a new album coming out this year on Solstice Day, Albon Heaven, which would be June, is it 20th this year, I think? Um, and we'll be releasing uh, it serially, so one song at a time over a period of weeks. And um, I'll let you know more about that when it gets closer. And I also would like to let you know that um, I also do ornithovoyance sessions on an individual basis through my Etsy shop. Um, and I haven't put the listing up there yet for this new shop. But if you're interested in having a personalized session by Zoom, uh, just if you've liked this, I would appreciate it if you'd like my ornithovoyance Facebook page. And we'd love to hear comments on, on what you thought um, went well, if you think we could improve, or if there's some other uh, question you'd like us to consider with divination, let us know. So again, thank you so much for coming. So stay safe in this COVID world and the world in general. Um, stay connected. And above all, stay kind. Thank you very much. See you later.